and we spoke about his extraordinary charitable work, the future of technology, but also about his view of the American economy. The headline, he's not too worried. Are we right now in a kind of crisis of capitalism when you see the financial industry seeming to be in, a, in meltdown or in at least dramatic organiza uh, reorganization? Is this the end of a certain kind of model of capitalism? No, not at all. The, it's a very interesting crisis, and it's important that it that things move forward, that markets are are continuing to operate, and there's some type of correction we'll have to look at in terms of the leverage we allow, the complexity of balance sheets we allow, uh, people who are so key that the government feels like they have to come in and bail them out, and there's a lot a lot of thinking that has to go on, but fundamentally, the total market valuation of companies, companies' willingness to invest. Right now, we haven't seen a huge disruption in that. There may be, it looks like the economy may be go down somewhat, but nothing like a, a big recession or a depression. And, you know, the amount of innovation taking place, the amount of investment is actually greater today than ever because you not only have more American companies with more scientists and engineers and innovators, but now you have uh, what Friedman calls the, the flat world, where you have uh, people from all over, including lots of people in India and China, now contributing to new drug design, new software design, new uh, energy uh, generation design. And so the, it's easy for people to underestimate that despite these imbalances that are certainly scary, the rate of improvement on the medical front, the efficiency front, communication front, is greater today than ever. And in fact, that's why you can take a problem uh, like the food crisis and say, uh, you know, let's get cheaper fertilizer, let's get better seeds, or the climate crisis and say, let's get a different source of energy that's both cheaper and doesn't generate CO2. And given the right time frames, the, this uh, rapid innovation will deliver those uh, advances. But we were told that there was a massive innovation taking place in the financial industry. <laughs> that it was producing all these new products which were providing Americans with greater finance, American companies. Was this all a sham or, or was the financial innovation which grew the financial industry to 20% of GDP? Uh, was it real? Was it, how should we think of it? Well, certainly whenever, you know, a stock goes up and then comes down, there was an element of uh, uh, a mistake that people thought, oh, this really is, is going to go on forever. Or, uh, it's, it's a great thing. These financial companies, in terms of needing short-term funding but not having liquid assets so that if the short-term funding dried mm -hmm. up, uh, you'd get it, literally a bankruptcy. And so all it took was a whiff of of uh, lack of confidence and then the whole thing would come apart. That was a, not a stable enough structure to deal with the mistakes that were made in mortgage valuation, particularly of the so-called AAA type instruments. Now there have been people, including Warren Buffett, that have talked about this level of complexity that some problems would come out of it. And so far, even despite this bailout, it doesn't look like fixing these problems is going to derail the economy in some dramatic way where you know universities aren't doing research yeah, and drug yeah, companies yeah. aren't doing research and software companies aren't hiring more engineers to sell to a market that uh, in the long run is going to be a bigger and bigger market and you know so we're maneuvering to make sure we don't get this broad contagion and experts who know uh, who live in that financial world should be disagreeing and debating taking a little time uh, to figure out this fix, but it's not yet really cutting into the fundamental thing that's going on in the world today, which is a, a, an increase in the scale of the economy, increase in the number of people going to colleges, an increase in scientific understanding, which the Internet has facilitated this great sharing. So, you know, our foundation has scientists in China and India and the UK and the US, and that, you know, during the course of a 24 hour period, they're sharing results coming up with new ideas, and you know, it's almost location independent. What happens to Americans, Europeans, um, Japanese, people in advanced industrial countries who can't uh, communicate constantly on the Internet producing high-value added goods? In other words, people who are 
you know, have simple skills, who are going to do simple repetitive tasks. Uh, what happens in this new world with all this innovation, but with everybody else competing, with everyone else rising, what happens to that person? And that is, we're talking about tens of millions of Americans and Europeans and, and Japanese. We certainly have a challenge that we have too many high school dropouts in the United States and the structure of our economy does not offer that many opportunities to somebody without uh, at least a high school education. There's always this fallacy that there's a certain number of jobs and the Chinese you know, it's are a finite, yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. somebody's taking them. <laughs> They're, you know, take farming jobs. Who took all those farming jobs? The tractor took those farming jobs. We feed this country on less than 2% of the population, and we're one of the great food exporters in the world. And so automation took those jobs. Is that a bad thing? Do people miss, you know, plowing? I don't know. I, I never uh, did it. As the economy expands, certain sectors like education and medical care and entertainment grow a lot bigger. You know, and until we can say that our education is perfect and the you know medical care everybody gets all the attention they need you know there there are jobs there we just need the breakthroughs that allow us to devote resources to those things so college educated people are going to have plenty of opportunities but uh, our education system is jipping people if it doesn't let them know that if they drop out from high school that they face a bleak future so they're they're really engaged uh, so that they... And you're very worried about American high school education, for example. That's right. The United States has the challenge that it really needs to educate everyone to quite a high level. Uh, some of these other economies, because they're not as far along, they still have manual labor, low-paying jobs. So China can feel great that 15 or 20 percent are college qualified, whereas in this country it's got to be a much higher number and our high school system hasn't improved enough to shift that average level of education. And so you have numbers that when I first heard them are unbelievable, a third of all kids dropping out of high school. And if you take um, ethnic minorities, you get in urban areas over half of them dropping out. And the outcomes for those kids are not attractive to them or to the society that they, they live in. Would you trade our educational system, lock, stock, and barrel, for any other countries? The Singaporeans test very well, the Finns test very well, the Danes test very well, we don't. Is there something lock, stock, and barrel better about any other system? I wouldn't trade with anyone. You know, we're a very large country. We have some big city challenges that many of those countries don't have. It's unbelievable that we are the melting pot, and it's great that we take on that challenge, which is not always easy. And which our drags down our averages sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our universities are the envy of the world. If you take the top 20 universities in the world, I don't think you'll find anyone who wouldn't have at least 12 of them be U.S. universities, and some might have 19 of them be U.S. universities. Now, China sees that, and... It's a great thing for the world that they're taking Tsinghua and Beijing University and uh, all the good universities and trying to up-level those. They, they've made good progress. But we shouldn't trade with anybody. Why are we the best in information technology and, and inventing new medicines? It's not because we have low defense costs. It's not because we have low medical costs. It's not because we have a simple society to get things done in. It is because at least for that top 20% or so that get a good education and go into these universities, the kind of innovative thinking and great teaching is strong. And there's an element of that that we've let smart people from other countries come here. We net import massive IQ. It's our most important import by far.